Good morning, Grace Church. Good morning. Yes. Welcome, everyone. Um, Psalms 84, um, the psalmist says like this. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. There's a reason behind why the psalmist says like that. Let me just give you two. Um, Let's hear from Psalm 16, which gives us the reason. A reading from the book of Psalms, 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. Psalmist says, in your presence, Lord, there is fullness of joy. It's not partial. It's not less. There's fullness. We don't want to go anywhere else than the presence of God, where we find the fullness, completeness, wholeness of joy. Second reason he gives, Lord, in your presence, there there are pleasures forevermore. The pleasure, the satisfaction of knowing him is not compared to any other thing. It's not but for a moment, but it's forevermore. Church, we don't want to go anywhere else than the presence of God. And when we come to pre- in his presence to worship him, it is in his throne room we come together to see him, to see him for who he is. Church, let's pray. Heavenly gracious Father, Lord, we want your presence more than anything else. For in your presence, there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. God, prepare us. Help us, Lord, to worship you today. Help us to come into your presence with our whole of our heart and our soul. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, if today if the Lord gives you any spiritual gift like words of prophecy or any other tongue, would you please come up forward and meet Pastor Steve, who's on my right, and he will let you know how you can use that gift for the edification of the church. Let us stand. Let's worship him. From the rising of the sun to the ending of the day, one name alone be praised. Every nation, tribe, and tongue of creation lifting up. Your name alone be raised. Praise the Lord, all the earth, all the earth. Bless His name, only one name, now and always. Jesus, you have rescued us. You are good and you are just. One name alone be praised. From the heights and from the depths, in every heart with every breath, your name alone be Now and always praise the Lord, all the earth, all the earth. Bless His name, only one name. 
now and always every sky is filled with wonder all creation lifting higher the only king who reigns forever who is like our god who is like our god every sky is filled with wonder all creation lifting higher the only king who reigns forever who is like our god who is like our god sing praise the lord all the earth all the earth bless his name only one name now and always praise the lord all the earth all the earth bless his name only one name now and always bless his name only one name now and always amen amen our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down And every chain will break As broken hearts declare His praise For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. So every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 
is up the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Oh. Amen. One Chronicles twenty nine eleven. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Amen. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. You give life, you give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that, yes, Lord, oh, great are you. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Sing all the earth. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Sing all the earth. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Sing all the earth. 
all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only Great are you, Lord. Yes, you are. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Sing, great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. Yes, Lord, we will sing forevermore. Great are you. Amen. Eternity, join the song we're already singing. Holy, 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 holy are you, Lord. Yes. Just to bow down before your throne, see your face, I cry out. Because you're holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Sing Jesus, Jesus, King of kings. Yes, you are, Jesus, Majesty. Those who have heard well done, proclaiming forever, yet you're the one. Faithful, faithful, faithful are you, Lord. What can we give you but endless praise? The heaven. Lord, as we shout, your name is Jesus, 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 you are Lord. Jesus, King of kings. Jesus, Majesty. Majesty. Worthy, worthy. 
worthy, worthy, Lord. Another glimpse of glory, we'll sing once more. Worthy, 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 Lord, forever, forever. Worthy, 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 Lord. Another glimpse of glory, we'll sing once more. Worthy. Worthy, worthy, Lord, forever, forever singing. Worthy, 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 Lord, another glimpse of glory. We'll sing once more. Worthy, 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 Lord, forever. King of kings, oh Jesus, majesty, Jesus, King. Majesty, worthy, worthy, worthy Lord. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Worthy, 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 Lord. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Holy, are you Lord God Almighty? Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Righteous is the Lamb. Sing righteous. Righteous is the Lamb. Sing Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb. Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb. Amen. Thank you, Father. We praise you. We glorify you. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are holy. You are holy, Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, for sending your son to die on our behalf. We love you. We love you forever. We worship you. May your name be praised and glorified in all our lives, God. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
Last week, we saw from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 15, that when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, not only are you forgiven for all your sins, past, present, and future, which is astonishing, but you become a loved, adopted child of God, son of God, daughter of God. And you receive the Holy Spirit, who will give you times when he pours God's very love into your hearts and makes your adoption real to you in your experience. God's very love. So that's times where the Holy Spirit pours God's love into our hearts. Now look at what Paul says about this in the first two verses in today's passage. Romans 8, 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God by pouring God's love into our hearts. From time to time, he does that. And if we are children, then heirs. We, are, we inherit something. Heirs of God. We inherit God. And fellow heirs with Christ. We inherit with Christ. Provided, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So because we are adopted children of God, we are heirs of God. What we inherit is God, which is amazing because God is the infinitely greatest joy in the universe. And you're going to inherit God. You're going to know God, worship God, fellowship with God, love God forever. You're an heir of God. What an inheritance you have awaiting you. And the reason we're heirs of God is because we are fellow heirs with Christ. It's not because of our goodness or our righteousness. It's because we put our trust in Jesus Christ who paid for our sins, who has saved us. We're united with Christ by faith, and we become fellow heirs with Christ. And Christ not only forgives our sins and cares for us and saves us, he also keeps us on the road to heaven, not sinlessly, but progressively, consistently. When we stray, he causes us to repent and brings us back. He will keep every believer on the road all the way to heaven, and you will enter heaven. But then look at what Paul says in verse, the end of verse 17. He says, all this is true, provided we suffer with Christ in order that we may also be glorified with him. It's not that by suffering with Christ, we are forgiven and saved. First, we are forgiven and saved by faith alone. But everybody who is forgiven and saved by faith alone is transformed into being someone who suffers with Christ. That's how we know we're on the road to heaven. That's how we know we've been saved. We're suffering with Christ. So suffering with Christ, that's the topic we're going to be talking about this morning. The first question that came into my mind was, what, what kind of suffering does Paul have in mind when he says suffering with Christ? What suffering is he talking about? We could think that the phrase suffering with Christ just means persecution for the gospel, suffering for our witness. There's believers in various countries who are in prison today for their faith. We could think it just means that. I think it certainly does include that. Absolutely. But there's two reasons from this passage why I think Paul is clear that suffering with Christ has to do with every kind of suffering that we experience this side of heaven. Two reasons. First reason, look at the way he describes these sufferings in the very next verse. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So suffering with Christ involves experiencing the sufferings of this present time. Well, this time right now before heaven, all the sufferings that people experience during this time before heaven, those are sufferings with Christ, therefore. All of them. Natural disasters, tsunamis, floods, sickness, cancer, bronchitis, being hurt by people, being rejected by friends, getting having a dead battery in your car here in Abu Dhabi, all the different kinds of things, little things, huge, heartbreaking things. 
The sufferings of this present time are what Paul's talking about. Yes, persecution and everything else. That's my first reason, first, that verse. No, second reason, verse 23. Look at what Paul says. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Groaning is a sign of suffering. And here Paul says we're groaning for two things. We want to experience our full adoption as sons, adopted sons and daughters of God. We love God. We want more of God. I want, I want the full experience of my adoption. And that's coming. So we're groaning for that. And we're also groaning for the redemption of our bodies, the resurrection of our bodies. Why are we groaning for the resurrection of our bodies? It's because these bodies are decaying. These bodies get sick. These bodies, unless Jesus comes back first, are going to die. And we're longing for the redemption of our bodies. We want those resurrection bodies, which means that clearly the suffering that Paul's talking about includes sickness and death. That's what Paul's talking about here. So, now let me, let me be clear. God can heal miraculously. God does heal miraculously. We love praying for the sick here at Grace Church. We'd like to see many, many more heal, but we are committed to praying for the sick. God heals through doctors. We're grateful for doctors. Who were the nurses we saw earlier? Okay. Who were the nurses? Anyway, God heals miraculously through doctors. But we have to understand God doesn't always heal. It's not always God's perfect, loving will to heal us. It is sometimes, and sometimes in his love and wisdom, he allows sickness to remain. And so Paul would include that in these sufferings with Christ that he's talking about here. Suffering with Christ includes all the sufferings that we experience in this present time. Persecution, sickness, everything else. So with that in mind, let's read verse 17 again so we see what Paul is saying. Verse 17. And if children, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Christ in order that we may also be glorified with him. Now notice, we will know we're saved and adopted children of God on the way to heaven, not just because we suffer, but because we suffer with Christ. Are you suffering with Christ? Have you suffered with Christ this last week? The sufferings you may be experiencing right now, are you suffering with Christ in them? So that was my next question. What does it mean to suffer with Christ? You can suffer without Christ, right? Or you can suffer with Christ. What's the difference? To answer that, let's remember, first of all, that Christ suffered. That's why we suffer with him. Oh, did Christ suffer the cross? Christ suffered the cross, paying for the sins of all who trust him. And our suffering is nothing compared to Christ's sufferings. Some of you have suffered in heartbreaking ways, devastating ways. But as, as great as that is, I hope you don't mind me impressing on all of us that 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 is nothing compared to what Christ suffered. So Christ suffered, and yet the fact that we can suffer with him means that there's some kind of parallels between his suffering and our suffering. There's no comparison in terms of the degree of the suffering, but there are parallels. There's some kind of similarities. So what are those similarities? Because as we think about those similarities, as, we, as we're living in the context of those similarities while we're suffering, then we're suffering with Christ. I thought of three parallels. See if these make sense to you. Three similarities between Christ's suffering and our suffering. First, Christ was called to suffer, and so are we. Christ was called to suffer, and so are, are we. God the Father called Jesus the Son. 
to suffer. And Jesus said, yes. And there are times where God calls us to suffer. And we need to say, yes. Now, don't forget, when trials come, we can pray and ask God to remove the trials, right? Deliver me. Protect me. Take this away from me. And God will often do that. Yes, absolutely. He will often do that. But not always. Often, in his wisdom and his love, he lets the trials stay. We should always pray, but there are times when he lets them stay. And in those times, we understand God is calling me to suffer. So I need to say yes. Now, I would guess that that thought maybe is shocking to some of you. Like, I've never heard that. And I, I understand. Um, you may have heard that Jesus came to give us abundant life, which he did. Praise God for that. And you may have heard that abundant life means a life without any suffering, a life without any sickness, a life without any financial need. That's maybe what you've heard. And if that's what you've heard, I would just appeal to you to hear me out this morning and maybe just start to look at the Scriptures afresh and, and, and see if, if what I'm saying maybe is what the Scriptures are saying. The Scriptures would be authority here, not me, right? It's important that you know what you believe because you've looked at the Bible yourself. What I hope to show you, let me give you two Scriptures that I think will show you that there are times when God calls us, His beloved, adopted sons, daughters, times when He calls us to suffer just like He called His Son to suffer. First scripture, Philippians chapter 1, verse 29. I think the scriptures are clear that Jesus brings us abundant life, but that abundant life, this side of heaven, includes suffering. That's what the scriptures teach. Look at Philippians 1, 29. Paul's talking to the entire church in Philippi. And he says, For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. It's been granted to you to suffer for Christ's sake. That we're granted the idea of a gracious gift. Now you may think, well, suffering for his sake, that's just persecution. It includes persecution, but Paul uses that exact same language in 2 Corinthians 12 when he says, for the sake of Christ then, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, yes, and calamities. So Paul includes all of those in something that he's suffering for Christ, for the sake of Christ. And so God calls us to suffer for his sake. I hope you see that here. Second scripture, Acts 14, 22. Paul has just planted some churches. He's going back to visit those churches, and he's going to preach sermon to these brand new believers. And what is Paul's sermon topic when he goes back and preaches to these brand new believers? Verse, or Acts chapter 14, verse 22. When they preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to these places where he planted churches, Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul wanted these new believers to understand the road to the kingdom of God, the road to the new heavens and the new earth, goes through many tribulations. It's not the case that the road to the kingdom of God, the road to the new heavens and the new earth, avoids all tribulations. It's not what the Bible teaches. This side of heaven, as we're on the road to heaven, the road that we are on takes us through many tribulations. Oh, I hope that that helps some of you where you've been under guilt thinking, why am I suffering so much? I thought Christians weren't really supposed to suffer. That is not the case. That is not the case. Again, we, we should pray for God to, to lift afflictions off of us and off of our brothers and sisters, but there are many times when in his love and his wisdom, he chooses not to. So 
So when you encounter suffering, brother, sister, when you encounter suffering, don't be shocked. Don't say, I thought God loved me. I thought I was saved. Pray for God to remove it. But if he chooses to allow it to stay, say, yes. He's calling you, at least for a time, to suffer. Whatever it might be, large or small. So that's one aspect of suffering with Christ. Understand that just as Christ was called to suffer, so are we. You understand that? This side of heaven, we're called to suffer. Second, remind yourself that Christ's suffering had a purpose, and so did ours. Now, Christ's purpose in suffering was to pay for all the sins of those who trust him. That's not our purpose. All the sins are already paid for. We couldn't pay for them even if we tried. He's paid for all of them. That's not the purpose for our suffering. But there is a purpose for our suffering. One we've talked about, like when we went through our series on Job, is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul says, remember the verse? These momentary light afflictions, momentary light afflictions, are producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. In other words, when you go through suffering, large or small, and you set your heart upon the Lord and you say, I want to trust you, you are my joy, I'm going to shine with your glory as best I can through this difficulty, maybe through the tears, as you do that, that's enlarging your capacity, your heart capacity for enjoying God's glory. That's one of the reasons God allows trials to come, because these momentary light afflictions produce for us an eternal weight of glory. That's one purpose. We've talked about that many times before. Filed that one away, but I want to show you another one, another reason. From 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. This is that God will allow us to suffer so that people will see our hope in Christ and want to talk to us about it. 1 Peter 3.15. Peter says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. One of the reasons people will ask you, where do you get this hope, is because you're going through suffering, and you are, maybe through the tears, shining with peace and confidence. See, because suffering costs us something. Whenever you suffer, you lose something that's precious to you. But see, if while you are losing things that are precious to you, if you're shining with confidence, hope in Christ, people will notice. They'll think, you've got a source of strength that I don't know anything about. You've got a source of strength that's not this in this world. You've got a source of strength that's out of this world. Where do you get your hope? And then you can tell them. Most of you have probably heard about the four men who uh, were killed in trying to take the gospel to the Alka Indians um, in the jungles of South America. One of them was Roger Udarian. They knew they were risking their lives. They landed their plane on a sandbar, and they were speared to death by the Alka Indians. Here's what Roger's wife, Barbara, wrote in her journal the night she heard her husband had been killed. She wrote this in January 1956. She said, tonight the captain, the captain who'd been part of the search team to find what happened, tonight the captain told us of his finding four bodies in the river. One had a T-shirt and blue jeans. Roger was the only one who wore them. God gave me this verse two days ago, Psalm 48, 14. For this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. As I came face to face with the news of Roger's death, my heart was filled with praise. He was worthy 
of his home going. Let me just pause there. Men, let's live so our wives say, my husband was worthy of his home going. Mm. He was worthy of his home going. Help me, Lord, to be both, both mummy and daddy. So Barbara suffered a devastating, heartbreaking loss. I cannot imagine what that would have felt like to her. But she had Christ. She had Christ. She was shining with confident hope in Christ that affected the people all around her. And that's one of the reasons why God calls us into the fellowship of Christ's suffering is because then we can have opportunities to explain the hope that's within us. Now, there's a third way that our suffering is similar with Christ's. And that is that Christ's sufferings brought him glory, and so will ours. Christ's sufferings brought him glory, and so will ours. You can see that at the end of verse 17, Romans 8. And if children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. See, after Christ suffered and died, God the Father raised him from the dead, brought him to heaven, seated him at his right hand, where Christ could shine with the glory he had shared with the Father from before creation, from timeless eternity in the past. So Jesus is now at the right hand of God, shining with glory. Christ suffered, and he was glorified. And just as Christ suffered and was glorified, so will we. When we suffer, we must remember, as Christ's sufferings brought him glory, so will mine. Now, Paul talks about that. That's the topic of the rest of this chapter, the rest of this passage for this morning. But first, let's review what we've seen. So let's take a real, real small example. Tomorrow, you get up, get ready, head out of your house, and you are just engulfed in heat and humidity, right? It just almost sucks the air out of your lungs. It's like, what am I doing living here, okay? Right? There you are. Now, but you remember, wait a minute, suffering with Christ. Okay? So you want to be thinking and conscious of three things. One, Christ was called to suffer, and so am I. This is relatively small in the overall scheme of things, but I want to suffer with Christ here. For the king in the kingdom, here I am in this country. Christ's suffering had a purpose, and so does mine. No random suffering, no meaningless sufferings. Purpose, enlarging my capacity for joy in him and Help me to shine with glory so people maybe will ask. And Christ's suffering brought him glory, and so will mine. Now, in the rest of this section, Paul wants to tell us why the fact that your suffering will bring you glory is such breathtakingly good news. Stunning good news. Why? Why is this such good news? Paul tells us in verses 18 through 25, gives us five reasons. This is such good news. I hope that you are captured by these reasons. First, it's good news because our sufferings can't compare with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Our sufferings in this life, as massive and devastating and heartbreaking as they can be, cannot compare with the glory that will be revealed to us. That's verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So Paul says that as painful as our sorrows can be, and, and again, I'm sure some of you, I know some of you have had devastating sorrows, but as painful as they can be, they cannot compare with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. So what is this glory that's going to be revealed to us? It's the glory of Jesus Christ. 
the glory of Christ himself. Now, what does glory mean? Glory is a hard word to define. Glory means like beauty, excellence, magnificence, greatness, majesty. That's all glory. Glory is why people wake up early to go see a sunrise, for example. They, they, they want to see glory. Glory is why people travel to Mount Kilimanjaro, climb to the top of that mountain, or the Matterhorn Peak, or whatever it might be. Glory is why you watch the Olympics. Glory is why, the, why you look at World Cup football. What you're looking for is greatness, majesty, beauty, excellence. That's what you're looking for. And the reason you're looking for that is because God made us, each of us, so that our greatest joys are beholding glory, beauty. That's why people travel to see these beautiful scenes and go to watch sports and, and the whole thing. But the greatest glory in the universe by far is the glory of God's love displayed in the Son of God being born as a baby, God becoming a baby, and then dying on the cross, God the Son dying on the cross to save us rebels. That is the by far greatest display of glory in the universe. Now, the problem is before we were saved, we were all blinded to that glory, right? We could read the Bible, ho-hum, you know, what's on TV, what's in the refrigerator, not very interested. Sin was blinding us to that glory. But when God saves you, he sets you free from that blindness. And he shines into our hearts the beautiful, dazzling, breathtaking, jaw-dropping glory of Jesus Christ. That's what he does. And then throughout our Christian lives, God will give us times as we're opening up the Scriptures when we see, we feel, we know this is the joy I was created for. Knowing God in the person of Jesus Christ, this is it. This is the glory I'm, I'm here for. Every believer has times when we experience that. We do see Jesus' glory now, yes, in this life. What Paul wants us to understand is that that is nothing. That's nothing compared to what we will experience at the end of history when we see Jesus face to face. That's what Paul's talking about in verse 18. Read it, read it, read it together again. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that's to be revealed to us. You can mix together a thousand Matterhorns in their glory, a thousand Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro in their glory, a thousand sunrises in their glory, Olympics, World Cup, football. You can mix together all of that glory, thousands and thousands of, of that glory. And it's like a drop of water compared to the ocean of God's glory in Christ Jesus. No comparison. And we're going to see that face to face when we see Christ face to face. That's what Paul's talking about. That's the first reason this is such good news. Our sufferings can't compare with the glory that's to be revealed to us. Second reason this is good news. It's because creation waits with eager longing for our revealing. That's verse 19. Paul says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. In the previous verse, Paul talks about Jesus' glory being revealed to us. In this verse, he's talking about us being revealed. We are going to be revealed. Here's what that means. When you are face to face with Jesus Christ, his glory is going to be shining blazing, beautiful, and you are going to be so transformed, so filled, so delighting, so celebrating, so exuberant, so completely transformed that you are shining with his glory. You are going to be revealed shining with the very glory, not your own glory. Well, I'll know it's not our own glory, but it's Jesus' glory, but you're shining with Jesus' glory. 
creation is eagerly waiting for that revealing. I heard a pastor describe it like this. So take the snow-capped, beautiful Matterhorn Peak, amazing. But what the Matterhorn Peak is saying is, when will the children of God be revealed? Or take the sun, blazing, bright, huge, beautiful. But with all that beauty and and glory, what the Son is saying is, yes, but when will the children of God be revealed? Even the whole Milky Way, massive Milky Way, what I don't know how many light years it is, it's many, it's huge, it's massive. But with all that grandeur and all that glory and all that splendor, the Milky Way is saying, yes, but when will the children of God be revealed? And the Matterhorn and the Sun and the Milky Way are talking about you. When will you be revealed? Shining with Jesus' glory. That's your destiny. That's what's going to happen to you. This is what's going to happen to everyone who's trusting Christ. That's what's going to take place. That's the second reason this is good news. Creation waits with eager longing for our revealing. And that should show us, oh, that glory must be really big then. And Paul's saying, it is really, really big. And your present sufferings cannot compare. Third reason, it's good news. Because creation was subjected to futility in hope of gaining the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Verse 20 and 21. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Now pause there. Satan didn't subject the world to futility in hope. God did that. God subjected the world to futility in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This verse explains why there is so much suffering in the world. Do you ever wonder why? Why earthquakes and tsunamis and floods? Why wars and sickness and pestilence and famine and poverty? Why? Why? It's not random. It's not ultimately because of Satan. It's because Adam and Eve did what we've all done. In their pride, they wanted to make their own decisions about how they were going to live their lives, and so they turned their backs on God and walked away from the infinite glory of the universe. That's what they did. And so God brought a curse on the world. Genesis chapter 3. He subjected the world to futility. But he did that in hope, in certain hope, certain confidence that the world would be one day, all of creation would be one day set free from its bondage to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So what this means is floods are not the last word. Babies born unhealthy are not the last word. Cancer is not the last word. Wars are not the last word. What's the last word? The last word is that God's creation is going to be set free from its bondage to corruption into the freedom of the glory of of the children of God, which means that none of these things are the last word and that your sufferings are not the last word. The last word is never-ending joy and freedom in beholding and shining with the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the last word. The last word that will continue forever. That's what Paul's talking about here. Fourth reason is good news because the whole creation is groaning for this with birth pangs. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth together until now. Again, Paul's goal here is to help us see that the sufferings of this present time are nothing compared with the glory that we will see 
feel, be transformed by, and shine with Jesus' glory that we will enjoy forever. And here he says that the whole creation, not just the whole earth, not just the whole solar system or the whole Milky Way, the whole creation, the whole universe is groaning to see Christ glorified and you transformed, shining with his glory. Church doesn't get any bigger than that. All of the universe is groaning for Christ to be glorified and you shining with his glory. That's what is happening. It doesn't get any bigger than that. And our sufferings, even the worst sufferings in this life, are nothing in comparison. Last reason. Fifth, it's good news because our full salvation is still to come. Verses 23 to 25. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. See, we have been saved. We have received the first fruits of the Spirit. But as amazing as our salvation is now, and it is amazing, there is so much more that's coming. We were saved in hope. We don't see something we're hoping in, so we don't see yet what we're going to experience, but we were saved in hope of that future. You know what first fruits are? We don't really talk about that much in our culture, but first fruits, like if you are growing wheat, say you've got a huge wheat field, you might pick a few of the first wheat sheaves. That's the first fruits. This is going to be a good harvest. Look at this. Or you've got a massive corn field and pick a few ears of corn. Oh, this is going to be a really good corn harvest. Okay? So you've got your first fruits, a few sheaves of wheat, a few ears of corn. We've received the first fruits of our salvation. Well, look at those sheaves of wheat. This is beautiful. And these ears of corn, yes. But look at the field of wheat that's out there. Look at the field of corn that's still out there. <laughs> this is beautiful, but look at that. And the, the point Paul's making is our sufferings can't compare with the glory of that future salvation that we're going to receive. It's absolutely certain. We have the first fruits now, but there is so much more. You've not received all of your salvation yet. You've received the first fruits now. Wait for what is to come. Church, the day is coming and we'll be saying, I should have waited more patiently. I should have waited more eagerly. I should have, I should have had my heart set on this more. Paul was right, right? So let's, let's take heed to that now. Full salvation is coming. The full salvation of receiving your resurrection body. The full salvation of seeing your Savior face to face. The full salvation of seeing Jesus' glory shining and all of God's children transformed, being revealed, shining with his glory. It's coming. And it will make all your suffering worth it. All of it. All of it worth it. Are you persuaded? Those are our five reasons. So what does this mean for us? Let me just give you two takeaways. If you are not yet trusting Christ, we are very glad you're here this morning. And I, I'm hoping that you want to be a part of where history is headed in terms of for those who trust Christ, it's headed towards the new heavens and the new earth where Christ and all of his glory dwells and we'll be transformed. Don't you want to be a part of that? Don't you want to know Jesus? Don't you want to behold the glory of the God who sent his son to be born as a baby to die on the cross so we could be forgiven and reconciled to him. So 
Don't you want that? Trust Christ. Turn from your sin. Trust him. Receive him. Trust him to forgive you. Trust him to change you. Trust him to satisfy you completely now in himself. He will, and then he will bring you to heaven where you will shine with his glory forever. And if you are trusting Christ, what assures you that you're saved is because you're suffering with Christ, Paul says, provided we suffer with Christ so we can be glorified with him. So, brothers, sisters, let's suffer with Christ. Let's suffer with Christ. Let's join in the fellowship of his sufferings. Not all suffering. We praise him for that, but there is suffering. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So whether the suffering is small or whether it's devastating and heartbreaking, let's remember, Christ was called to suffer, and so are we. Christ's suffering had a purpose, and so does ours. And Christ's suffering brought him glory. And so will ours. So will you. Let's stand together. Father, I pray that you would pour out your Spirit and touch each of our hearts with exactly what we need. Comfort, strength, conviction, a wake-up call, salvation whatever it might be, Lord. We praise you for the glory that's coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, let us rejoice in this blessed assurance that we have in Christ as we sing this praise. This world is not my home I'm here but for a moment It's all I've ever known But this world is not my home The fight is not my own These burdens aren't my future The empty tomb has shown I am bound for glory. I am free because I am bound. I am bound for heaven's gate. Where my feet will stand on holy ground. I am bound for glory. The saving work is done. And death is not my ending. My God has overcome. I am bound for glory. I am free because I am bound. I am bound for heaven's gate. Where my feet will stand on holy ground. I am bound for glory. Bound for glory. All my pain, hurt, and shame. God, when Jesus calls my name, endless joy, endless praise. Oh, when Jesus calls my name, all my pain. Hurt and shame, God, when Jesus calls my name, endless joy, endless praise. Oh, when Jesus calls my name, sing, I'm free because I'm bound. 
I'm bound for heaven's gate Where my feet will stand on holy ground I am bound for glory I am free because I am bound I am bound for heaven's gate Where my feet will stand on holy ground I am bound for glory Where my feet will stand on holy ground I am bound for glory Bound for glory you are part of the Al Bandar home group and you're available to pray for people after the service, if you could come on up and stand at the far right-hand corner, we'd appreciate that very much. And if you need prayer this morning, if you're sick and would love prayer for healing, we would love to pray for you. We'd be honored to pray. If you're going through suffering, we'd love to pray for you. Whatever it might be, job issues, maybe this is the morning you want to give your life to Jesus Christ and put your trust in him. We would be thrilled to pray for you about that. So don't hesitate. Let me speak this benediction over us from the book of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen, amen.